Next, let's turn our attention to covalent bonding and the kind of structures we might expect when we have directional covalent bonding. Let's take a couple of lectures to get through this, but the starting point in this lecture, we're going to look at an electron counting scheme that's going to be pretty useful for us. So if we were to think about the periodic table and we were to focus on elements, let's think about where we see a crossover from covalent bonding to metallic bonding. If we're to move across the third period, as we see here, let's start with chlorine. And let's just apply the kind of rules we use in GenChem. Let's do Lewis dot structures. Let's try and satisfy the octet rule. So for the halogens, like chlorine, there are seven valence electrons, one short of an octet. And so each halogen atom has to make one covalent bond to complete its octet. If we move over to group 6A, we've got sulfur. There were two electrons shy of an octet, so each sulfur atom has to make two bonds. Moving once again to the left, column 5A, the nictogens. Then we have only five valence electrons, three short of an octet, so we need to make three bonds per atom. And so in the various polymorphs of phosphorus, uh, here I show the white phosphorus, you always see phosphorus making three bonds to its neighbors. When we come over to group 4A, we now have only four valence electrons, and now each atom has to make four bonds to its neighbors to make up its octet. So you have structures like diamond. Here, the structure of silicon and germanium. So these are really important semiconductor structures. And we can still get to an octet through covalent bonding. Then we move one element more to the left, and we're at aluminum. Suddenly, the number of valence electrons, three per atom, is not even halfway to an octet. And at that point, it's just not feasible to satisfy the octet rule through covalent bonds. And so the aluminum goes a very different way and says, let's crowd together as closely as possible. Let's delocalize the valence electrons and share them collectively. All right, and we call that metallic bonding. Now, we can put an electron count argument to this in general binary compound. We're going to say there's a more electropositive element, which we're going to call C, and I'll call that a cation in air quotes, and a more electronegative element, which we call A, which I will refer to as an anion in air quotes. Now, we can figure out a lot about what the bonding and the structure is going to be if we think about something called the valence electron count per anion. If we have something like sodium chloride, well, the sodium has one valence electron, chlorine has seven. We know the sodium can give up its electron to the chlorine so that the chlorine now has an octet. And that's like a textbook ionic compound. And so in this formula, E of the cation would be one for sodium. There's only one sodium atom in the formula unit, so M is one. The number of electrons per anion is seven. The chlorine atom has seven valence electrons, and there's one chlorine atom per formula unit. So the numerator becomes eight, and we divide by the number of anions in the formula unit, which is one, and so we come up with eight. Let's use this for a compound that is clearly not really ionic bonding. The bonding in silicon dioxide is, in fact, quite highly covalent. How would this octet rule work in this compound? Well, here's our formula. The number of electrons per silicon, silicon is our cation in air quotes, is four, and there's one silicon atom in the formula unit. And the number of electrons per oxygen is six, and there's two of those in the formula unit. And then we divide by two because there's two oxygens. And that's going to give us 16 divided by two, which is eight. So we can say that the octet rule is obeyed. You know, at this point you're saying, I don't know, that seems like kind of an elaborate way to tell me something I already knew. But the point here is that we're keeping track of the electrons 
it doesn't matter whether the compound is highly ionic or in fact quite covalent, as long as we can identify a more electropositive element and a more electronegative element. Let's do another example and see what might happen when the valence electron count per anion is not eight. So sodium thallium, well, here's our formula. Sodium has one valence electron, thallium has three. And so our valence electron count is four electrons per thallium. We can think of the sodium giving up its one valence electron to thallium, and it now has four valence electrons. Well, four is not eight, right? So we're not obeying the octet rule. So what does that mean? Well, to answer that question, let's look at something called the generalized eight minus n rule, or sometimes it's called the generalized octet rule. With the formula we used on the last page, we can determine that in sodium thallium, the valence electron count per anion is only four. What does that tell us? It tells us either that the anion has too many electrons or too few. In this case, four is less than eight, so it's too few. So for the thallium to get to the octet rule, it's got to make bonds to other thallium atoms, just like phosphorus or sulfur or silicon all have to make bonds to other atoms of the same type in those elemental structures. Here we need anion-anion bonds, thallium-thallium bonds. Sometimes we'll see that the valence electron count per anion is actually larger than eight. And in that case, that means the anion cannot accept all of the electrons from the cation. And so some electrons have to be left behind on the cation. And that number we call CC. Um, and so if there's electrons left behind on the cations, either we're going to get cation-cation bonds, or we might have um, non-bonding electron pairs on the cation. Okay, let's apply this rule to our sodium-thallium compound. We've already calculated that the valence electron count per thallium is four. Now, if we use this generalized eight minus n rule, what can we learn? Well, let's plug the four in for the VEC sub A. And then if we look at the right-hand side of this equation, we can see that you know, because eight is larger than four, we need AA, that's the number of anion-anion bonds, to be non-zero. It's not going to help us at all to have cation-cation bonds or cation lone pairs. So the middle term there drops out, and then we can determine that the number of anion-anion bonds must be four. And if you were to look at the crystal structure of sodium thalide, what you would find is that the thallium atoms do make bonds to each other in a diamond network. So if we look just at the thallium network here, it would look like silicon, like diamond. But then we have these sodium cations that are also present you know, in the interstices, the voids within this framework. That's not a big surprise that we get a diamond network in some ways, because here, thallium, once it gets that electron from sodium, has the same number of valence electrons as silicon, as carbon. So we expect it to form structures like silicon and carbon would form. Now, that structure, sodium thalide, is kind of an unusual structure in our list that we started this structured lecture about. I mean, is it an ionic compound? Is it a metallic compound? Uh, is it a covalent compound? You know, if we were teaching general chemistry, I bet every Gen Chem student would say, well, that's a metallic compound because sodium is a metal and thallium is a metal. You're making a compound from two metals, you expect it to be a metal. Yes, there's some logic to that, but the properties of that compound are not really like a metal. It's going to be diamagnetic. It's going to have a pretty low conductivity, nothing like the conductivity of thallium metal or sodium metal, and it's going to be brittle rather than being ductile. And all of those are kind of characteristics we normally would associate with something like a covalent network solid. A phase like sodium thallium is what we call a zintal phase. 
And those phases follow the zindel klim concept, where we have an electropositive metal, here's sodium, that donates its electrons to the electronegative metal. So we have ions in this structure. And then the electronegative metal realizes its octet, typically through forming bonds with other of the more electronegative metal species in the structure. We see here also the structure of strontium Ga2. That's another zental phase. There, if you think about it, the strontium, which has two valence electrons, gives them up to gallium. So gallium normally would have three valence electrons, but and there's two of them. So once we get those two electrons, one to each gallium, the gallium now has four valence electrons. So it's a VEC per A would be four. Well, it's going to need to make four bonds then. And in that structure, the gallium forms these planar sheets that have bonding very much like the sheets in graphite. All right, three sigma bonds and a pi bond. All right, so those are examples of zintel phases. Let's finish by you doing a couple of examples. Here are two compounds, tin 2 chloride and calcium antimonide. I'd like you to apply the generalized 8 minus n rule and tell me what you find in these compounds. Are there cation cation bonds, anion anion bonds, cation lone pairs? Uh, what's going on in these compounds? We'll pause the video, you work out your answers, and then come back and we'll go over them. All right, let's start with tin chloride. So if we calculate the valence electron count per anion, uh, tin has four valence electrons, chlorine has seven. And so we come up with the valence electron count per chloride of nine electrons. Because that's larger than eight, the chloride atoms cannot accept all of the electrons from tin. So we're going to go to our generalized 8 minus n rule here, plug in our numbers, and you can see now that we don't need any anion anion bonds. So if we solve for CC here, it comes up to be 2. So CC is the number of electrons that are left on the cation. So tin has two leftover electrons. And what happens in this case is those electrons on the tin uh, go into a lone pair. So it's pretty common that when you have tin 2 plus, you might have a non-bonding electron pair on that tin 2 plus, and that's what happens in this case. Now, in the case of calcium antimonide, if we do the calculations, we find that Calcium gives up two electrons to antimony, which had five valence electrons. So the valence electron count per antimony is seven. Right? That's less than eight, so the octet rule is not obeyed here without doing something else. And in this case, the CC term is going to drop out, but we need AA, the number of anion and anion bonds, to be one. So when you have one bond, that means that you're going to form dimers. So two antimony atoms are going to come together and form a dimer. And this also makes sense because with a valence electron count of seven, the antimony is behaving like a halogen in this compound. And what do halogen atoms do? Well, they tend to form one bond to make a diatomic molecule. Here we have a diatomic ion, sp2, 2 minus. And that covalently bonded polyatomic anion is charge balanced by the calcium 2 plus.